Okay, Panasonic UB9000, 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray player. Uh, people have asked me about uh, best settings uh, for the player. Uh, so I thought I'd put a video together on uh, what the best settings are and why I choose them, things like that. Uh, let's just get going. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is a custom wallpaper. You can, over in this setup over here, you can put some uh, custom wallpapers. Uh, most of the people's screens will be black here, I think, uh, with a fade uh, going on. But uh, yeah, you can put some custom wallpapers. It's pretty good. Really simple to, to do. But uh, yeah. So I'll put it in a video format and then I can choose to pause whenever I'd like. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I thought I'd just show what this menu uh, app system looks like. Uh, it's pretty much a disaster. Um, looks like 1995 all over again, I think. Um, not much love has been put into these apps. Uh, this is a 4K Blu-ray player. I would not buy it as an app uh, box or anything like that. It's uh, really bad. Uh, it's pretty much a waste of your time using any of these apps on this system unless you had absolutely nothing else. Um, Prime cannot play Dolby Vision correctly through this app system and is just a complete waste of time. Uh, if you knock it, if you knock the settings back to HDR10, then it does play fine. Same with Netflix. Netflix actually um, forcibly scales everything to Dolby Vision. Don't know why. Uh, I don't like that. I want native content as native content. I don't want scaling of any kind. I don't. I don't want any of that. That's the type of person I am. It's the same with audio. I don't want my audio scaled. You know, if it's in stereo, then that's all we get. It's in stereo. If it's in 5.1, I'm not upscaling to, you know, something else. YouTube, uh, YouTube app is actually not too bad. Um, <clears throat> just from the point of view of using it from a uh, watch later list slash history and hey I want to just listen to, to some music on YouTube uh, it's fine for that I don't really go out of my way to do it but uh, yeah bit of a shame they didn't really put more into this uh, these, these apps uh, you can create levels and layers of the apps and stuff like that again this was like 95 I mean it could have been before that I mean look at this this menu system is horrific um, again, if you see a, if you see on the box there's an icon for YouTube and the apps and stuff, uh, don't buy it because of that. But I did want to show it. Uh, there are options there. Um, it can be done. Um, it's not always the best. And you have to downscale everything to uh, HDR or turn off Dolby Vision to make things work correctly. But uh, it can be done. I just don't advise it. I'm one of those those types of people that um, if I'm buying a 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray player, I want it to be good at playing 4K Ultra HD Blu-rays. Uh, I don't care that this player doesn't have SACD. I don't care. I don't care about any of that. The reason I don't care is because when I want to listen to SACDs, I will buy a $3,000 Toshiba SACD player to do that. Um, I know ev I know a lot of people are looking for that all-in-one box that can do everything. Um, the problem is when you have that, you cannot be good at everything. You just can't. So I need something that can be good at playing 4K movies, and this is the player that can do that. So... That's just the way I am, uh, and this is why I, I bought this player, you know, so. Okay, um, so let's just go back real quick. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is the uh, screen, the player screen. Now again, 
Panasonic haven't put much love into the menu system on here. It's super basic. Um, in some ways, I appreciate that. In some ways, it's like, hey, can we, uh, you know, can we not make this look a, a little bit more modern and stuff like that? If there was a sacrifice in picture quality because they had to introduce like better menu system and stuff like that, so be it. Then we get better picture quality. That's that's all I care about in movies. Uh, audio is passed through Bitstream anyway, uh, so your receiver is, you know, decoding it. Uh, you know, so I need good picture quality. Audio is, you know, it's all Bitstream, so it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, and this menu system, this menu system, you should not be in very long. Once this player is set up, there is. To be fair, there's no reason to really come back into this unless you made a mistake somehow, you know. Uh, from that point of view, if you want to do something, you can achieve it here. It's fine, it's usable, uh, but it doesn't look pretty at all, does it? So, um, resolution. Uh, this is a, this is going to be a good one to talk about. Uh, this is the, okay, this is the screen. So, I set the player to 4K. Most people, when they get the player, will it will be on auto. The issue with auto is though you will run into or can run into uh, double handshake. Now this is just uh, this is not just an issue with uh, say a Panasonic EB9000. This is an issue with anything that is HDMI and is set to auto. When um, a device, player, or, or anything is set to auto, the player or device will turn on, send a, a signal, and try and communicate with the, the, the device on the TV on the other side. Uh, that is really one handshake. Uh, the other handshake is uh, trying to understand what is on the other end. Can this TV display 4K or not? Um, I've heard issues where things, this is causing that issue of a second handshake and sometimes blacks aren't truly displayed correctly because uh, there was some error in communicating in the second handshake. I have not had issues with this personally, however, I know how, I know issues with, uh, you know, uh, HDMI, how finicky it can be. I would not, I, I just don't want to run into any errors and issues with HDMI handshakes or anything like that. If you put it on 4K, it is one handshake, it is clean, it, uh, it simplifies everything. Uh, one other thing to say about this is if you put it in auto, this doesn't mean that Blu-ray content uh, is output in 1080p, it doesn't mean that. Um, it, this is just to communicate with the TV. Is this TV 4K, or is this TV a 1080p TV, or you know, in the worst case, maybe a 720p? But um, yeah, that that's really all, the, all this is used for. The the best setting for um, to not to be error free uh, if you don't have a ultra high end TV that you know they've put a lot into into the HDMI uh, sockets and chipsets and things like that. Um, maybe in uh, you know you know maybe the lower end TVs like Vizio and things like that that do have some handshake issues with with things like this. Use 4K. I do. I always do it on devices, um, and I do not have handshake black levels or any issues when I do this. So I definitely recommend putting it on the resolution that you have. If your TV is only 1080p, I would not, again, don't, don't put it on auto, actually set it to 1080p. It's just a lot cleaner from a HDMI handshake uh, point of view. So yeah, uh, 4K60. I will, th in this case, um, when you set it to 4K60 for the first time, uh, the player does a test and communicates to the TV, can it display this? If you can see the image, it will set it to uh, this. 
If you can't, it might set it to a, a different setting. Uh, so yeah, mine was 4K60, 444. I will talk about bit depth maybe um, when we get to the advanced section of the uh, of the HDMI. But yeah, uh, if if your TV can pass it, I would just unless you really specifically do not want that uh, for whatever reason. Now, um, I'm I I like to manually set settings, right? I hate things that are set to auto. However, in this player, auto doesn't necessarily mean uh, <laughs> automatic, or it's uh, it's having to judge whether it would do this or this. Uh, as you can see, uh, re realistically, this means on or off. You know, it's not. It, it really isn't auto. What then? What they really mean by auto is this screen, for instance, that we're that we're on, is probably 60 frames per second or 30 it could be it could be one of those right it's not a the, the most graphic stuff I'm either made in 60 frames or 30 frames right so when 24 frames material comes on uh, it will essentially just turn on you know there's no there's no real auto here uh, the auto I guess is, is just for um, the, if the, if you absolutely cannot display it, it would then maybe forcibly turn it off. Um, I have never had a TV that can't do 24p output, so uh, you know. But uh, yeah, uh, a lot of these settings are like this. They're auto. Now this for the HDMI. I use two HDMI's, uh, one for audio and one for video. The reason I do that is because. Again, I've been around receivers, I've been around HDMI now for a long time. I do not trust putting my video signal through anything other than the TV. Nothing. I don't want, unless it's specifically a video processor, uh, bought with the reason that this will improve my picture. Uh, I've seen receivers before in pass-through mode meaning that it's literally pass should only be passing through the signal of the video apply edge enhancement uh, different color gradients um, like I said edge sharpening of the image no I'm not I'm not running this through a receiver there's no way even the new ones um, sure they really might be in true pass-through mode now but I'm not doing it Again, it's a potential another HDMI handshake uh, that, that could go wrong by running through a receiver. I've been around HDMI too long, and I don't mess with stuff like that. So I split everything. Um, what this means, though, is when it's on auto, is if it detects that you are only using one HDMI, then it will put the video and audio through. Otherwise, if you have split your audio, it will only do video only. Whereas if you choose this setting, it absolutely will only do video and audio through one cable. So I set this to auto. Now again, the HDMI audio, uh, I put for audio only. Um, yeah, pretty simple. You you literally only get audio through that. There's no video or anything whatsoever. So uh, Dolby Vision is on. I use a LG C9, and uh, yeah, pretty simple. HDR10. Uh, shame we don't get TVs with both HDR10 and Dolby Vision. Maybe do, I, I don't know if Panasonic uh, have that available, but uh, I really wish LG or somebody would pick up on that because there's a lot of 4K Blu-rays I'd love to watch um, in HDR10 Plus. I mean, Alien being one of them, they actually did a really good job on that. It looked uh, that's an excellent transfer. To be fair, it looked good on H just standard HDR, so you know. Um, 
but on the flip side this uh, player has uh, some other settings we'll talk about later that kinda negates having HDR10 plus anyway so alright color mode um... okay so you honestly could leave this on auto um, I don't like auto again uh, I'm not an auto person. I don't like my HDMI devices choosing what is best because sometimes they get it wrong. And through a poor handshake or some, uh, you know, error or whatever, they 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 just might choose the incorrect incorrect one. So I've ran a lot of tests with Spears and Munsell test discs, uh, the Blu-ray side and the 4K side, and in theory. You should not see a difference between it, uh, both of these. If your TV and the device itself is doing f uh, the chroma upsampling, uh, subsampling correctly, you you really should not see the difference between these two. So I have a few uh, little tests on Spears and Munsell discs that. If you don't see any errors in 444, your TV passes 444 completely fine. Um, there's also um, some, even on the menus of Spears and Munsell's, the 4K disc, you can see uh, bit depth errors if this isn't set correctly. So. Uh, I've seen it on my previous TV. My previous TV was um, a uh, Vizio. And the difference between these two was actually completely obvious. When you had it in 442, uh, it, the TV could not fill in the rest of the 44 from, the, from this point. Uh, it's chroma upsampling and stuff was basically terrible. So I then let the player do it, 444, and the fonts on the screen were all now all clear, uh, and, and, and it, it displayed perfectly. So I would say, uh, to, be, to be honest, for, for just normal people, if you don't have test discs to really, really truly know what is going on, I think probably auto is the best here. I would never use RGB or enhance, you're not in the correct color space. This is not the correct color space for movies. Never use these. Unless you're on a monitor, like an actual PC monitor, I would not bother with, with these settings uh, at all. Most TVs, I would say, well, I guess high-end TVs, um, should be able to pass 444 by now. Uh, maybe there are some cheaper models that uh, still potentially struggle with this. The safe bet, though, is always 422. Uh, 100 percent that is a really safe bet. Most, I think, I can't imagine any TV having an issue with this. At least you shouldn't. Most TVs should be designed around this. Um, and in some ways, this actually uh, may help later on. So, uh, let's continue. Oh, uh, real quick, yeah, before we move on. So, 444 and, and these settings and 12-bit and things like that, um, these only affect modes that are not Dolby Vision. Modes that are Dolby Vision are enforced, that you, meaning you, you cannot change them. It is enforced 12-bit, it is enforced RGB, and it is, it, yeah, that's it, that's it. I was going to say, the because the, the TV actually shows uh, the Dolby Vision signal as 8-bit, it's actually not. It's, it is a, it is 12-bit. Um, so yeah, these, these settings only uh, affect Blu-ray, uh, they only affect HDR10, so yeah, you ju just, just keep that in mind. Uh, Dolby Vision is, is enforced. Um, now, Again, auto, um, you know, auto 12 or 10. Um, if you can, I would always go to auto. 100% always go to auto. 
Um, there is a, uh, what, sorry, 12-bit, yeah. Always go to 12-bit, and the reason is, is because um, if you actually look at the specs, if you look at the specs for HDMI 2.0, 12 bit 44460 is is actually past the um, spec of the actual cable itself. Um, now you could say, well, I'm just going to lower this to uh, 10 bit. And when I watch Gemini Man, <coughs> excuse me, when I watch Gemini Man, it will pass 10 bit 444. Um, at 60 frames per second. Well, if you actually look at the spec, that cannot be passed using 10-bit, and the player would probably force it down to 8. Um, how you would actually overcome this is by setting the color mode to 422 and 12-bit. That's if you're watching Gemini Man. Um, and 60 frames per second content in HDR so again, the safe bet is either is either auto or 422. The reason I do it 444 is because I don't watch 60 frames per second content. Um, uh, without getting too far into it, I think it's an abomination of film and uh, it is just not for me. Uh, so I don't watch that content anyway. However, if I did want to watch that in the highest quality possible, I would set this Again, I probably should just set this to auto. Um, it would then fill in the blanks, so to speak. Um, it pr this player preserves bit depth over uh, the color mode, so uh, it would it would uh, prioritize 12 bit over having 444. It would lower this chroma um, essentially to 422, which is really nice that the player can do that. But again. I like to set things how I like to set them and I don't I don't play that content anyway. Everybody else 422 or or auto uh would definitely be the the best uh, best thing there. So okay. Now this is really good. I don't know if I know too many players that can do this. So if you have a projector you can actually turn the BT2020, which is like the HDR color space, into SDR, which is extremely nice um, to do uh, for, you know, projector guys. Uh, you can retain the look of HDR, uh, but essentially just pass it in, into an SDR signal. That's, that's great. That's really, really nice to have that, uh, that option to do that. Um, <clears throat> now you can also choose to just down convert to SDR. So if you didn't have an, a, a HDR TV and you were like, Look, I want to I wanna buy 4K Blu-ray movies, but um, you know, maybe I upgrade my TV in, in a year's time. So, I mean, in, most TVs are actually HDR now, but it, look, this, if, if you wanted to, if, you, if this was your, you know, this was your situation, that you didn't have a HDR TV yet, you can at least down convert to SDR um, and, and watch very good 4K encoded movers with, without all the HDR either, so that, that's nice too. Um, I keep this in uh, HDR BT2020 because I can display HDR content fine. But yeah, again, to have these options is extremely nice. Uh, this is a SDR slash HDR conversion for network uh, stuff. Uh, this can be uh, on. I don't think. I don't think it's for apps. I think it's actually for uh, network stuff over your own network. Um, and even if it isn't, I would I refuse to turn this on anyway. I don't want to convert anything to anything ever. I play everything always in the, the native um, signal that it is, and I always turn this off. Um, again, HLV conversion. Uh, I'm not doing it. 
So, so you can you essentially you can convert the HLG signal if your TV couldn't do that to HDR PQ. Again, um, I don't actually play a lot of I don't think I play any HLG content anyway. So I think it might be more prevalent in Europe, but uh, for me I just turn it off. Now this is important. So, um, <clears throat> when you set this to OLED, you are telling the optimizer, which I'll discuss a little later, uh, how many nits your display essentially has. Uh, OLED here is set to 1000 nits. Uh, this is for projectors. I believe this is 350 nits. And the basic uh, is 250 nits. Uh, the super high luminance is 1,500 nits. This is 500 nits. No, 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 no. This is 1,000 nits. This is like OLED. Sorry, sorry. The middle one is like OLED. And the basic one is 500 nits. So, um, if you're an experimentalist like me, um, you always want to kind of see what these do. And you want to see how it works with the HDR optimizer on this player. So for anyone that doesn't know, um, HDR Optimizer comes on this player and it actually d it needs turning on when a movie is displayed or you need to go into the menu system to make sure it is turned on. What it does is if um, you put in Spears and Munsell demo disc, uh, that content is recorded at 10,000 nits. Well, no display on in the world can actually display, I mean, I won't say in the world because I, I don't know. Um, nothing you can buy <laughs> from a store can display 10,000 nits. So this player has a HDR optimizer function and the 10,000 nits gets pulled down essentially to 1,000 nits uh, or whatever whatever you pick here. 350 nits, uh, 250, 1,500. So really really good setting and um, yeah, so I've done some tests of uh, basic luminance at 500 uh, nits compared to setting it to OLED. On the Spears and Munsell disc, on a specific scene in the snow, if you, if you know the demo disc or if you know the scenes, uh, there's a snow scene, all of the snow is completely blown out in 10,000 nits. With no optimizer, no you know, nothing turned on, just standard HDR10. It's completely blown out. And um, with uh, with this on, it ret now retains all of the effect of the snow. You can see deep into the snow. It is, it's, it's excellent. So I guess when I said earlier, it's a shame we can't watch movies in HDR10+, this, this essentially makes up for that. Um, you might, you potentially could get more performance out of um, HDR10 Plus because it's truly optimized then for your display. This is just saying, hey, I have an OLED. It's around um, a thousand nits, and we're going to see how how close we are. So my my LG C9, we calibrated uh, that uh, for the second time uh, to get better results. And we calibrated to 804 nits. So we're around 200 nits off. Um, but to be fair, that, that's completely fine. But in my mind, uh, the way my mind works, okay, we're not, we're not, we're not exactly at 1,000 nits, right? So let me try uh, basic luminance. So I tried basic luminance on the same scene and it wasn't as dynamic and it was washed out. Um, whether this is specific though for LCD, these settings, is possible. Um, the biggest one I guess I should have tested was the 1000 nits versus 1000 nits. Do they actually look the same? I may have done it. I think they did actually look the same. Um, but again, from this one to this one, uh, OLED just had much more vibrancy and you could tell it was tuned perfectly for the TV. So there are some other, th other settings though you can do to improve uh, this. 
uh, by the way. Um, now, <clears throat> if you have a TV released, um, an OLED specifically, if you have a TV released before 2019, so one of, the, one of these older TVs, um, where the nits really, really are low, and you are getting into like the 600 nits and stuff like that, um, you could try basic luminance. That would cap everything to 500 nits, and sure, you are not fully using your maybe 600 nits or potentially even lower, uh, absolutely, but what this would do is it would guarantee nothing is crushed whatsoever. You could try that. You could even try OLED and just see what you think looks better. If you have anything specific, again, like the Spears and Munsell test disc, or a disc that you know is, say, 4,000 nits or higher, um, these are good, these are good uh, things to test with. Um, I don't... I, I've even I have tested these again. They're they're not good, you know. That they are meant for projectors. They just they wash. They essentially wash everything out. You lose dynamics. Uh, none of none of none of these other settings, uh, if without an OLED, are, are good. So this this setting is tuned, in my opinion, perfectly. Uh, maybe maybe for a C9 and above, but uh, it is tuned excellently. So really good setting, and I'll explain. Uh, how to use it though, and uh, a little bit later. So 25p f uh, and 50p. This is a European thing. Um, I used to live in Europe, and um, I would put it to auto. And the reason is, assuming your TV can play it, but um, I would put this to auto, which essentially means turned on when you get the content. Uh, I. Um, encode some material from Europe that is 25 uh, frames per second and even if I'm not encoding it um, I download the content and I want to view it it is 25p it's nice to actually be able to display that stuff in the correct frame rate um, if you turn this off if you turn 25p content off you will start to get um, screen tearing issues um, the frame rates are, are juddery. Uh, this is like 3-2 um, pull down, I guess you could say. It's very similar to that, where the frames are not matching the actual frame uh, rate of the TV and things like that. Uh, so I, I would put this to auto, and uh, it, will, it should smooth out any content that you're playing in 25 or 50 frames per second. So always put this to auto. If you limit uh, your HDCP to 1.4, it won't pass uh, 4K. So, don't do it. Content flags, get them off. Absolutely turn them off. Anything that can adjust on the fly my TV or interact with my TV or um, like CEC for the HDMI, like communicating with the TV, I want it off. I'm not dealing with any, again, I've been around HDMI too long. I don't want any of these triggers, content flags, or anything like that um, on the player. So, uh, yep, yeah, audio output. <laughs> Pretty simple. And now, this is actually interesting. Uh, I am, again, if you, if you hear me, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and know me for a while. I'm not reformatting my audio. Uh, I'm not scaling. I'm not putting my sound in a different format than the native sound format ever. I, I never do that. I'm not an Auro 3D guy. I don't upscale. I don't do any of that. Uh, I want to know how the movie sounds and how the movie is in its native uh, formats. However, this is interesting. There are a couple of niche situations where this could be useful. So surround sound with 6.1 channels. Can you think of that? Well, if you remember, if anyone remembers that far back, uh, EX uh, used to be a thing where it is uh, Dolby EX uh, DT. I don't know if I don't know what this what it was for that, but. Um, yeah, some movies were uh, actually 6.1. I, 
I think the first two Harry Potters on Blu-ray might actually be 6.1 channels. They're not 5.1 or 7.1. They're actually mixed in between. So why this is important, or it, it is a useful setting, I don't use it, but it is a useful setting, is some receivers will take a 6.1 uh, movie and will only put it out of one channel, out of the back surrounds, the very back surrounds. They will, they will just either put it in one speaker or they'll put it in the next. What this does, it essentially, um, what's the word? Matrixes? Yeah, I guess that is the word, really. Um, but it will put it in both channels, right? So it, it, it would probably just mirror uh, both of the channels. Uh, this is nice. Uh, this is this, this is actually nice to do. However, um, a lot of receivers actually do this now already. Uh, you don't need this. Um, however, there could be situations where um, it it may not be doing what you think it's doing, your receiver, and this actually just takes care of that issue for you about putting it about putting those that sixth channel in mono at, at the back if you have two channels at the back like I do. Um, I have four speakers behind me on the bass level, uh, the surround uh, right and the surround left, and then the, the two at the back as well. This can be a useful setting if your receiver and things like that, you're using an older one and it puts things in mono, can be useful. So yeah, that's the advance and all the video stuff. Okay. So. If you've been around DVD uh, for as long as I have as well, uh, with Oppo players and things like that, they always used to have this um, as a setting as well, back then. Uh, back then it meant a lot more. Back then you had interlaced video and if you paused on a frame, you could actually be pausing on half of the frame and and if you went forward again, you would pause on the next half of the frame because of interlaced and the way it works. It draws the first 30 or the first half of the picture and then the next half and comes in and out. Uh, you, you could be getting that, that issue, right? So uh, from that point on, I always use my still frame and pause videos on frame. Uh, today, this is not really, this is really not a big, big issue at all. Uh, now, uh, talking about encoding and things like that, whether this pauses on an iframe, I don't know. It, it, it may. It may. I, I, I'm not 100% sure about this. If anyone that doesn't know, iframe is the highest quality frame every 24 seconds. So, uh, I would never use field. I never have. Uh, I, I knew how bad it used to look. Uh, frame is the highest quality uh, paused picture frame that you can get. Uh, just in case you want to take pictures and things like that of, uh, of uh, your TV in paused mode, uh, you will be getting the highest quality uh, pictures there. Um, so seamless play is for music and stuff like that. Uh, occasionally I do use uh, listen to music on this player. Uh, it's not my main player for music. I do like having this, this type of stuff on. Uh-oh. What's that? Yeah, dynamic range compression. No. Turn it off. It comes on by default. Or auto. It's going off. Turn that off right now. You're not compressing, there's no, there's, I mean, to be honest, there's no need for this setting, really. It might be a requirement. It, uh, it needs to be turned off. If you want the best sound, you turn that off. Uh, digital, uh, set everything to, if, as long as you're using HDMI and things like that, set everything to Bitstream. This is how you pass through Dolby Atmos, things like that, DTSX. Um, secondary audio, you always want turned off. Uh, you will not you will not be able to pass uh, Dolby Atmos and that with this on, I believe, and you get you even actually get a different audio. Uh, again, I don't really know why you would do this. Like if I want to listen to maybe another secondary audio track, 
I will choose to do that in the menu system. Uh, so bitstream, bitstream. You can set these these to PCM, by the way. So if you do actually only have 7.1, um, and let's just say your digital audio converter in your receiver or processor, whatever, you knew it was bad, right? You just knew it was bad. If you set this to PCM on both, now the player's DAC takes over the sound, uh, which is actually quite good uh, in this player. So you could do that. Uh, that's fine. But yeah, Atmos, uh, DTSX, everything like that, Bitstream, and everything else off. My receiver can do 192. Not a big deal, but it, it, it can do 192 um, with um, audio files and things like that. Uh, I just set it to 192 because that's what my receiver can do. If yours can't do it, uh, you know, you can uh, set that to what you need. Down mix. It's n this isn't a big deal to me. Um, I listen to everything in its native sound anyway. Anything, anyway, I'm not down mixing things like that. Uh, immaterial, uh, really. This this setting, to be fair. If for some reason you can only down mix two stereo, and you don't have a surround sound system, then yeah, sure, fine. But e even then, if, if if that was the case with with this, uh, with the sorry, with the with the digital output. Um, you would probably have to set that to PCM if, yeah, you'd have to you'd have to set this up completely differently if you did only have stereo. Uh, you might actually even have to come through analog uh, to do that. Um, HDMI output settings for music playback. Um, I keep this on normal. So uh, the reason I do is because uh, when you listen to music, you can set the player to essentially turn everything off. And what this does is it turns off a lot of the digital systems uh, for picture quality, uh, the chips and all of that type of stuff. However, what this does is the player will output 480p or even 480i to lower as much video processing as possible to prioritize sound quality, I don't want to do that. I just don't want to do that. We're, we're in a world where um, these systems and players that we're buying, especially at this cost, around the $1,000, and to be fair, they're even cheaper than that. Once you've got these digital equipment, you're not, re the noise floor on these, you're not getting raised noise floor from having the video circuitry turned on. You, you, you know, in normal playback, you're just not hearing that. Um, that would be the only reason you're doing this, is because you wanted to lower that noise floor even further. But we're, we're in the weeds at this point of, of trying to pick out as much quality as absolutely possible in sound. Um, when listen, This is when listening to... Um, you know, just music, and, uh, you know, I just don't think it's worth it. Uh, it's, there's no appreciable, appreciable gain uh, from doing this. Uh, there might be a test out there that shows, oh, look at that, my noise floor went down by half a dB, or it's just, you know, it's just not, not really something I need to focus on. However, this this um, this does have some good uses in another way. So for movies, um, you can actually turn on high quality sound, not for the reasons though um, that I was just discussing. Uh, the reason this actually can be useful is it turns the front display off. It turns the front display off. So when you're listening, so a video playback is whenever you're watching a movie the front display can be turned off and whenever you're listening to music the front display can be turned off uh, also you can enforce that audio is only coming out of the HDMI and again out of the HDMI but again we're in the weeds at this point with audio and noise and things like that these devices are so well made now um, 
you don't need um, power conditioners, things like that, to improve their sound. It's it's do the player already does it. Um, it doesn't need this cleanup. It really doesn't. But this is nice to turn off the display if you really want to, you know, get in uh, to a movie. It is nice to do. Audio delay. Never mess, in my opinion, never mess with audio sync on a Blu-ray player. Always set it to zero. Uh, analog multi-channel is off. Um, now, on the flip side of, of what I, I am ju I'm just saying, um, that you know you can get noise from one side to the other and things like that. I do make sure anything analog and things like that, when any, anything is going through HDMI, is turned off. Um, just in case, uh, I know I was kind of saying the opposite the other way, um, but there is no need to have analog audio on when you are listening through HDMI. There's just no there's no reason to do that. Uh, I've tested this by plugging in uh, some cables to the back. There's when there's audio coming out of HDMI. There's nothing coming out of analogs. So again. The circuitry and the way this player is set up is so good in the first place to try and eke out a little more. I'm sure, you can try it. Um, I just don't know if it's uh, if you gain anything. Uh, voice guidance. So, 3D playback. Um, I do set before you play. <clears throat> I don't. I, again, I don't want the player to take on the role of choosing for me what uh, I can do, what I can display, and things like that. So I set it to set before play. Uh, I set my 3D movies to playing 2D because I, I don't have a 3D display. But I also put the precautions on. So. Um, that's just how I set things up. I've done that all the time because I've never actually had a 3D uh, display. Um, I, I don't like the idea again of my player being set to auto. So I do everything. I'm in control of everything. I am the captain now. So uh, yeah. Now, um, subtitle language will be set to default uh, in the default version of the when you, you when, when you buy this uh, so but again um, I am forcibly setting everything to be exactly how I want it to be everything gets set to English because that's my native language so um, yep uh, network yep it's all pretty now we're, now we're pretty simple into this uh, network settings, uh, that's what the screen looks like. Uh, I'll discuss this later uh, when we get there. Uh, this is this is interesting. Uh, we can connect through wired or wireless. Uh, I am wireless now. <clears throat> I don't intend streaming really on this again apart from YouTube, so it's not, not a big deal. Uh, let's come down. Okay. Very interesting setting this. So, uh, I am a stickler in my reviews, and I uh, well, I, when I used to write my bigger reviews, I do quick reviews now. But I am very aware of audio levels being too low or too high. Uh, generally, not too high, um, but that'd be a rare, a rare occasion. But again, this is for network services, right? This is for uh, YouTube and all of the all of the apps <clears throat> you can this is on by default and it's an auto gain control what that essentially means is it will raise the or lower the audio based on how horrifically loud or low the audio is again if you know me I'm not having this on whatsoever I want to receive the content exactly how the volume it is supposed to be on uh, because I don't want to clip, and I, you know, I don't, I, I just don't want to touch any of this. Nice, nice option to have, though. 
Um, if you really were listening to content that was low, um, I, th I think this would pick it up. And if, again, if it's horrifically loud, it would, it should lower it. Um, but I noticed that some of the music I was listening to on YouTube had di way different volumes, or there was compressing bass and things like that. And I'm just like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I can't do that. So, <laughs> could be useful, but uh, I'm glad I found that setting because I, I couldn't find that setting uh, one time. So, uh, this is uh, for your home network. I do not stream. Uh, from my PC to this device, I'm not just not that type of person. I put everything on a USB stick that I want to watch, and I test through the rear USB. So yeah, real quick with the USBs. There's two USBs. Uh, one is at the front, and the other is at the back. The one at the front is uh, like 500 volts, I think, and the one at the back is 900. Essentially what that means is the rear USB is the fast one. So I do, I've do. i encoded like my videos, uh, some videos and stuff before, like from open source content. I put it in the front drive and uh, the frame rate's all clipping and it, it, it can't keep up. The data rate was just too high. So you put it in the back and now it plays like 100 megabits uh, per second content, completely fine. So uh, it is probably annoying to have to go round to the back to have to do that, maybe for some people, including myself. I always keep a little flashlight ready uh, just to get around there. But um, yeah, I, but the streaming part from another PC, things like that, I, t I always turn that off. Uh, so this is an interesting one. Um, it comes, uh, the player comes by default in Limited. Um, but, which is completely fine, which is, um, uh, just like it pulls that, like, information from BD Live and things like that. With Allow All, though, is sometimes you actually can get trailers, uh, pulled from it, and, um, when we come in for, like, say, a Saturday night and we're, we're bringing food in and things like that, somebody can put the disc in first, and uh, it can pull, so you say, some you know Sony trailers on some random Blu-ray or anything like that before the movie starts. I have seen that before, and I'm like, you know, it kind of gets you into the mood of of watching a movie by having a few trailers play at the start. However, uh, if you really did not want any any of that, just prohibit all of that type of content and all that extra type of content that can come on the Blu-ray discs. You really don't want to see it. You can just turn it off. Uh, however, right now I'm kind of uh, I was like, let me try all. Uh, you know, just to see how it is. This is really immaterial, though. If you, if you, again, if you don't like it, just uh, you can turn it off or only have um, the limited is. Uh, kind of like only official sanctum, sanctioned uh, stuff that was supposed to be on the disc will we'll, we'll only get seen. So, uh, I don't use any of the voice controls and things like that. Um, <clears throat> we can go over these quickly. Yep, no limit. I don't want any rating adjustments, no limit. not locking the network and you know so the easy setting is uh, essentially this automatically gets run when you put a uh, when you get a player for the first time it will run a basic test to see uh, what your display is capable of that type of thing all right another thing Viralink that's what Panasonic uh, calls CEC uh, which is um, a way of controlling the TV with the player and doing, you know, all sorts of things uh, that I do not want done. So that is 100%. I, to me, I think it's obnoxious um, to turn my player off for whatever reason um, or t 
or TV off or anything like that. I don't want any of this thing going on with HDMI. I've never liked any of any of that. <clears throat> uh, so that gets turned off. Now status messages. Um, when you put a movie in, and in the corner here it comes up, uh, say 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray or um, it might say HDR or something like that. I turn all of that off. I don't want to see it. The reason I don't is because I get um, <laughs> I get double messaged all the time by the player and then the TV itself. When Dolby Vision kicks in on a LG, you get to see it, and then you're getting this message come up on there as well. It's just like, look, it looks messy. I don't, I don't want that. Screen save is extremely useful. Uh, for playing music and you still have your TV on so you can play the music and uh, the TV will essentially go black screen um, maybe with a logo I'm not too sure but um, I this is a, this is very good especially for music because um, I do use sometimes some burn-in discs and things like that uh, to play you know for hours on end and um, thank God the you know the player has gone into a screensaver function for the display because that could really hurt an OLED so um, I like to keep my display on the front dim because um, it gets me more immersed in the movie like I said you can you can turn the display off um, front display on the player off entirely whilst watching a movie However, I do find that restrictive because um, as a reviewer or I, I want to know where that particular scene was, at least I have an idea of when the timestamps are because on this player it, it will show you what time you're at and it, it's like a countdown. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't show just the chapter like some other players. It actually shows you where, what timer you're actually at, and that is useful and relevant information to me. So I keep it on dim. Uh, I think bright is actually a little too bright for me. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's auto. Again, I'm not having a system automatically dim and, uh, you know, nah, not for me. So it's one or the other. It has to be set up uh, in a particular way. Uh, if you want to get back into the weeds, uh, if this this light is dimming coming in and out, that potentially could introduce noise into the system. I mean, you know, not necessarily, but it, it's, it is something I think about. Uh, quick start. Did I go over this? Yeah, okay. Now, with... Uh, software systems, HDMI, I am very aware of bugs and errors that can exist in players and everything, especially coming from Oppo and things like that. However, this is what I, I do on this player. I set this to turn off, right? Uh, set quick start to turn off. What I do then is I... Um, you, you've just got the player and you're setting up your settings, right? set this to turn off edit all of your settings get everything set how you're supposed to supposed to get it set right once everything is set correctly turn the player off um, I, a minute or two you know I want to I want to reset the HDMI I want to reset everything everything gets turned off then what I do is I turn everything now back on so that handshake and everything the connection to the TV and everything is clean now that's 100% clean. Then I come back in here and turn Quick Start on because that initial handshake and everything now is, is essentially complete. However, um, some TVs, um, again the older ones, I would definitely say Vizios, that's for, that's for sure because I've seen this issue as well, do not like Quick Start uh, because the player is essentially in... Um, it's not on, but it's it can essentially still be on in the background, and commun there could be some communication with HDMI, and you know a HDMI handshake goes wrong because this was turned on. 
Um, the the issue is though is that when it is off, the startup time is significantly increased. I don't really like that. And knowing that I can I can get away with this, and I have no issues with with HDMI handshakes or anything like that. I do appreciate using this. However, if you do have any issues with with handshakes and HDMI's and things like that, I would 100% turn it off because when you turn on the TV first, uh, your surround center around receiver next, and then you turn on the player, you will always get a clean HDMI handshake no matter what. There's no issues. There's no you know, hey, I watched this one time and I thought the black levels were completely off. Well, it could be this. It's definitely an option that it could be that. Anything HDMI is definitely potentially a problem. Uh, firmware, uh, sorry, firmware update. Um, I turn them off because I know when firmware updates go live. Um, uh, I don't like to turn on the player and the player start searching for an update and things like that. I don't want it to be I know it's it's not a an animal or, a, or or whatever but I don't want it to be bothered or in any way by searching for an update every single time I turn the player on I just don't want that uh, system information uh, this is the yeah, firmware okay so this player did have issues with playing Dolby Vision content before the 1.69 update However, I have not seen any Dolby Vision issues since they firmware updated this player. Uh, the flickering in... Um, I can't remember the movie. Uh, it's the anime. <laughs> there's an anime, there's an anime uh, cartoon as she jumps off the building at the start. Oh my god, what? How could I forget that movie? I was brain farted right now. However, there was stuff like that that kept on flickering all of the time. Um, there were others as well that were like uh, causing pulsing and things like that with Dolby Vision. Uh, so if you do get this player or you 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 have it, 100% make sure you're you're on the 1.69 update. Because that fixes basically every uh, Dolby Vision issue that I know that was out there. Um, so yeah, once we got that update, uh, this player was definitely, uh, I would consider the best now. I want to know what that movie is now. So, and yep, you can restore. Um, okay. All right, I have a disc in. I'm actually getting really hot now. Okay, this should be Spears and Munsell. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, before we... Um, you can pull up some options on every piece of different content that you play. So this is a, a Blu-ray. So you have its own settings for Blu-ray. Um, the reason I picked this screen is because uh, this is a sharpness pattern from Spears and Munsell uh, on the standard Blu-ray disc. And the reason this this is important is because um, there is an edge uh, there's an edge setting on the player that can smooth out this um, ringing around here and here and here. Uh, the ringing is ca caused from uh, scaling from 1080p uh, to 4K. This is one part of the ringing. But also, uh, slight ringing is actually built into 1080p content. I've seen it just all of the time um, on uh, old DVD players and uh, 1080p uh, Blu-ray players as well, and I, I don't quite know why that is. Uh, it has this ring in. However, there's um, some settings you can do to improve it. 4K doesn't have this, so I hope I put. Okay, so this is um, this is the extra. This is the menus that you can pull up. Um, the important, sorry, the the important one is the second one here. So um, you get these uh, settings. 
um, that you can change. Um, noise reduction, you know, stuff like that. Well, everything, again, should be zero. You should not adjust any of these. However, the sharpness setting um, is actually interesting. Let's um, keep going. Right, so you, your, your display type, uh, projector or normal. Picture type. Normal is the best setting because normal is the setting that uh, retains uh, the color as it's supposed to be from the high end to the low end. So I would never use, I, I've never used any different picture type other than normal for any Blu-ray or DVD player I've ever owned. Um, everything zero, unless you specifically need to change that, should be zero. Again, zero. I mean, my TV is calibrated anyway, so I wouldn't even want to touch any of this. There's just no need. Right, edge correction. Now, in theory, uh, edge correction one gets rid of this ringing and this slight uh, jagginess in uh, this image and around the circle uh, of this test pattern. However, I found personally that two blends everything absolutely perfect. Um, now there is one thing to say about this and that is with 1080p content um, the more edge correction you put in, um, essentially you could look at it as the more blending you're doing um, to make it smoother and you, you bring the ring in, in, things like that. There is potential, I'm not saying there is, but there is potential to um, maybe adjust and soften film grain by doing this. Um, it's just a little bit of a theory of mine that that could be happening. So I would just be very careful of that because um, you can do this on 4K as well. Um, now, what I do is I set this to two or I just have days where I'm like, I'm going to set this to one because I'm kind of in my mind just experimenting with different looks and the way, it, d does it really affect things? On 4K, I would not do this though. I would set this to zero because I've ran the same tests in HDR and there is no uh, edge correction needed. Um, and again, if there is any loss of detail of any kind because you're smoothing and, and things like that, I don't want to do that. So even for me, this is rare that I would have to do this. Um, but edge correction, it, it is very useful, definitely. Um, you probably cannot see anything that that does on uh, noise reduction. So, noise reduction, every single setting you want to go into um, or content that you're going to watch, this should be zero. So, go into the apps. Um, I th To be fair though, I think the apps and the USB are the same. So let's just say you was playing um, some MP4 content on USB with uh, some video. Go in, make sure everything here is set to zero. The edge correction is really up to you. If there is a loss of detail, again, I would not, I would not do it. If you can prove it to yourself uh, that there is a, 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 any loss of detail, definitely do not do it. Um, so that would be one. So you've got your streaming apps and things like that because they run on this on this filter as well, this video bank you could say. Um, this all needs changing and setting to zero. And DVD needs it as well, that's separate. That's got its own separate thing of uh, mosquito noise, noise reduction. Again, I don't watch DVDs anymore. However, uh, I'm one of those people that in the event that I did, I want to make sure all my settings are correct and everything is set to zero, noise reduction and everything, you know, 4K as well. Now, as soon as you do get to Blu-ray though, however, as soon as you get to Blu-ray, everything else, no, but as soon as you get to Blu-ray, uh, all of the settings in this list are actually set to zero. So, 
you have uh, set one and set two. Uh, these are essentially um, uh, options that you can choose. Um, this one on the right is, um, it blanks everything out. Um, now, when it's blanked out, you can still see what settings this is using. So you can click in on these and see what they're using. Um, see if the noise reduction is set to zero, even in this mode, uh, which is, it probably should be pass through, like, like you know, pass through mode. Um, but I, I always set it to this and um, my setting is either two, two, one or zero of the sharpness adjustment um, for standard content. Um, progressive, always, always auto. Never set that to video. But again, it doesn't, it, it really has no effect on today's content. So, uh, sound effects, do I show? Good. So, no. Absolutely not. <laughs> I've experimented with them, yes, but uh, no. Turn them off. They do not. They do not, do not deserve to be there. I just choose the highest sound effects, uh, the, the frequency. Sorry, that is uh, that's as high as mine goes. That's fine. Dialogue enhancer, no way. Again, my system is set up exactly how I want this. Uh, no. High clarity sound, though, is again to turn the display off. You can do that. This, uh, this you can set this here, or you can actually set it uh, on the remote as well. So, yeah, you can actually you can turn it on and turn the video off, so you can just hear audio, which is actually uh, I don't use it, but it could be useful. Um, imagine there is a noise floor uh, that could be that could be useful. Um, but um, you can use it on for the video as well. So you turn the high clarity sound on, but the video is also on. You get the display turned off and everything is in, I guess you could say, immersive mode. So. Uh, now, um, filter, uh, analog out filter. If you do if you do use this as a player for music and things like that and you are using the analog outs I suggest sharp filter there's a reason why if you know how the filters work um, imagine um, <clears throat> okay imagine we are zero and we are I mean, well not zero yeah zero zero and uh, 20 kilohertz right so a if you were using a slow roll off we would be we, you'd roll off the, the this is the treble side right at 20 kilohertz you'd roll off you'd start rolling off early and you're 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 taking away some information from the music and the signal itself too early um there's another uh, filter as well again i wouldn't use these let me just check to see if we no we don't but i i, I sh sharp Sharp filters are the best because this retains as much audio information as possible. Um, so I would never, I would always use a sharp filter. Okay. Uh, next we got up and... What did I put in? Okay, so this is Spears and Munsell. This is the uh, HDR version. So yeah, if you've never seen this disc, this is a test disc by Spears and Munsell uh, with HDR test patterns, things like that. It's in Dolby Vision, it's in HDR 10 Plus, um, but his content is graded to 10,000 nits. There is no disc, well, at least I don't think there is, unless if, you, if you've found one, please let me know. Uh, but there is not discs that I know that are made with 10,000 nits. Uh, no one can actually really display this correctly. Um, but again, this is the benefit of Dolby Vision. It can scale this perfectly. Um, you can choose to display this in HDR10. Full 10,000 nits in HDR10. 
Uh, that's that's a challenge because uh, somehow your TV has to do all the tone mapping, you know, things like that. Very very difficult. Um, yeah, there's uh, this is this is going to be a challenge for anybody's system to do. But again, now you with this player, you have the HDR optimizer. You could run 10,000 nits, and it optimizes it down. Now, I don't think that is the best version um, to actually watch. If you were watching H just the HDR10 version with no tone mapping, or just the player uh, doing the optimizer, I still think when content is optimized perfectly from Spears and Munsell, they've optimized it for 1000 nits. This to me is better um, than pushing the system and having the player trying to pull 10,000 nits all the way down. That is extremely difficult to do. There is potential for some odd uh, crushing and not retaining all of the information as it's supposed to look. Um, so I'd, it, when, when you're getting into the HDR10 side of things, I think, I think the 1,000 nit, 2,000 nit-ish uh, looks really, really good. Uh, because that's that's designed. This is designed content design for our TVs, you know. But the Dolby Vision version, you can play the full 10,000 nits. Uh, Dolby Vision scales everything absolutely perfect to your TV. Ab looks absolutely excellent. Um, <clears throat> now Fell and Mel. My understanding from Fell and Mel is um, the differences between the two is this is a low bitrate version of Dolby Vision. Uh, not what you think though, that doesn't mean it's bad. And um, this is a high bitrate version of um, Dolby Vision. Um, this is more metadata in Fell than Mel. However, um, now I have heard that um, Mel has, Mel can fully pass 12 bit information better than the Mel. I don't know if that's actually true or accurate. Um, I just read it somewhere, and maybe this was from a while ago and things like that, but I did read that. Uh, that is interesting. However, um, here's how I like to think of Mel and Fel, uh, the difference between these two, is I've been told that uh, Mel um, can have anywhere from 0 0.5 megabits per second to around 6 megabits per second of metadata information to tell the TV this is the lightness and the, you know this is what's going on in this scene and, 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 all, and all the metadata information. Fell is above that. I believe it starts at 6 megabits per second and goes anywhere I think I think up to around 14. Now that information gets taken away, in essence, from the disk itself. So you would have to, in let's imagine you used full fell at 14 megabits per second. That 14 would have to get taken off of the top, and now you're encoding a video at 80, uh, I don't know, 84, 81 megabits per second, because you've put so much information into fell. And the real question is, is it worth it? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't have things to test this, but um, yeah, I just wanted to give you some information uh, about that. Uh, there is SDR content as well. And uh, if anyone doesn't think SDR content looks good, uh, check this, uh, this file out, or this, uh, this, this out. Incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, actually, I've got another video as well to show you how good SDR or why SDR looks good on this player. So, so I'm playing the 10,000 nit file. Um, I don't go further than this screen. I'm not uh, doing it for that reason, but I wanted to show you now. Uh, now we have Ultra HD Blu-ray as an option. Uh, the old one was just Blu-ray and this is a custom set out of two and this one is essentially just pass-through. Uh, so, alright, 
So HDR optimizer, it may not be turned on by default. So you'd actually have to come into this option screen and turn it on. So what is it? Uh, well, my OLED setting at the start was 1000 nits and now uh, we've turned turn this on and this 10,000 nit content that I'm about to play is set to 1000 nits. The, the white point is now set to 1000 nits. So instead of the white point being 10,000 nits, which is all the way up here, uh, you can't, sorry, you can't see, it, which is all the way up here, you're now going to be able to see this. So it is, it's, no other player has this. No other player has this where you can actually play standard HDR content and it still look good because I do uh, press releases and things like that and I do see a lot of comments saying well oh damn it doesn't have uh, Dolby Vision that's a real shame I, I you know HDR doesn't really look that good well with this it does because you're not crushing anything this way with the HDR optimizer on okay there are settings here I really would not get too far involved in these settings at all um, and in in reality I'm really just testing this setting right now so don't get too crazed on yeah I think negative one is, is the best setting or anything like that I am testing this setting so I have two uh, versions of um, Donnie Darko um, the reason I have two is because one was the version that didn't work correctly and the other version is the one that uh, Arrow sent out to us uh, to fix the issue of uh, it had poor frame rate uh, it wasn't it wasn't uh, authored correctly the disc so they they uh, had to roll out a new disc so um, but it's good having it's good having two 4k players and you can see how things look so number one I want to see how the disc looks in Dolby Vision and I want to see how the disc look, looks in HDR10 and get an idea for the brightness difference because when I when we calibrated our TV Dolby Vision calibrated at around uh, 792 nits and, Dol uh, and HDR10 calibrated at 804 I think I said it was something like that so there is a difference in perceived brightness going from Dolby Vision to HDR10 now what this does is if you remember me saying that well I just sorry I just said it <laughs> um, we, we got to about 800 nits 800 nits is our white point it's not 1000 this is to 1000 right this this optimizer function is is to 1000 so what I do is the dynamic range adjustment is essentially like what the, the optimizer is doing it's it's bringing down the white point from 10,000 nits to 1,000 but the dynamic range adjustment is also doing something extremely similar to that where it is knocking down the white point slightly what negative one does on, a, on an LG C9 is make HDR content, HDR10 content brightness wise look exactly the same as Dolby Vision because there is a difference in perceived, perceived brightness I always, I'm always like, well, HDR10 this looks slightly brighter. Uh, Dolby Vision is a bit more controlled and subdued. This brings it more in line. Now, could you go lower? Maybe. I wouldn't go too low though, because you are you don't want to start crushing too much dynamic range. But within reason, um, you might be able to get this in between one and two. Um, on older TVs. Again, if your if your HDR level is on this is too high, and you were using uh, the OLED setting, and you knew you only had 600 nits, you might be able to pull this to like three or four, uh, pull it down. But again, if you've got a disc that you can somehow test the HDR10 versus the Dolby Vision and get an idea for the brightness, I'm lucky I can switch between players uh, pretty much instantly um, and see that brightness what it is and this really does this really brings now HDR 10 in line with Dolby Vision so really good setting uh, but yeah I wouldn't go too far with this um, 
So, uh, I think that is, uh, I think that's about it. Um, I might have one more thing to show you. Okay, well, let's just look at this. Um, again, zero. No edge correction on HDR content. None. Again, because um, that uh, ring in is really from scaling. A lot of it to, to do is from scaling, coming from 1080p to 4K, right? You can set a little something in there just to help with that. With this content, I've run tests. There's no r extra ringing coming through. And I don't want, I want to preserve as much detail as possible in, in this image. Noise reduction. Yeah, no. Same. You get these two, these settings. Um, so yeah, that's about it for that. Uh, let's see what else we've got. So next disc. Next, next disc is the reason why this player, I revere this player versus all other players, apart from its video processing and, and things that I have talked about. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Kino Lorba. Okay. This is a 4K for a few dollars more. Now, I reviewed this disc at 5 out of 5. And, uh... This disc is SDR, by the way. Okay, so I paused it there. What do we see? This is SDR content, which is really bad, right? It's really bad. It really is not bad, no, it's not. The reason it's not bad is because this player retains the 10-bit information from the disc. 10-bit. Other players do not do this. Other, n I don't know. I know for a fact that none of the MediaTek chip players do this. The Pioneer, the Oppo, the Revon. Uh, there's a new uh, 4K player come out in Europe, a Magna Vox. No, that, that, that sounds like 80s or something. There's other players that, that do not do this. They cannot do that. This is one reason why I, this, this player is essential. What does it actually mean? What it means is, is for the first 0 to 100 nits, the color that you are actually seeing in this image looks extremely like HDR content. Why? Because we're in 10 bit already. We're in 10 bit. That's exactly the same as HDR content. HDR content, some of the content is between 0 and 100 as well. And, um, this is why you can get uh, such good looking discs. And I, I do see a lot of people poo pooing this idea that SDR discs on a HDR format, I will not buy that. There's no way I would buy that. When you watch it on a Panasonic UB9000, you realize that you've been wrong all of this time. And you've been poo pooing this idea of uh, discs looking really bad. It is because of your player. Um, a lot of these players do not display this correctly. My Revon, again, 8-bit. This is 8-bit. That means that it, the display and everything is having to dither that image and it just doesn't look as good. So once I found out that this player does this also, uh, my disapproval also, I, I, I'll admit, I had a disapproval of SDR content on 4K, but it was only because of what I was coming from. I was coming from an Oppo that could not do this. I was coming... Uh, well, I wasn't coming from a Revon because I bought this player next. But you understand my point. Um, this player is... Uh, I, I love I love everything that this player can do. And again, I, I didn't buy this player to focus on its streaming capabilities, um, playing music, playing... Um, now, some of the DVD... Uh, not DVD, but the, some of the Blu-ray audio music, sure, that's fine. We can pass it through an Atmos, you know... We're going to have the good picture quality with it as well. It's it's that's what it's there to be, but I don't. I, I this player is not um, you know the universal player, the player that can do absolutely everything. It focuses on what it's good at. This is what it's good at: SDR content or HDR content. 
if it doesn't have Dolby Vision, we still have the optimizer. This player has everything. This 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 player is great. I absolutely love this player. Um, I do not see this player being beaten for the foreseeable future. I'm seeing these other um, Oppo copycat um, manufacturers come out and produce 4K players. They are trying. I'm not disputing the fact that they're trying and it's good to see, it's always good to see new players come out and that somebody wants to try something new and uh, some of these players might might they could be good um, but they do have a lot of work to do with the chipsets being used and what they're actually capable of doing and if at this point if you have a choice between those players and a Panasonic um, UB9000 or the 820 uh, the 820 has all, everything that's in this is also in the 820. So don't think because, well, I'm going for a cheaper version, my sound isn't going to be as good. My, well, analog, I know, but HDMI sound is the same. The video processing is the same. However, it doesn't have the processing and extra capabilities for projectors. So if you add a projector, and at this point, you know, if you've got a projector, you're spending a reasonable amount of money on your home theater anyway. You need a player like this. Or you need some type of um, uh, Mad VR processor or something like that to make HDR content downscaled. Oh, well, actually, this does it, but you, you need a, a, a way of, of dealing with that. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I love this. Big fan of this player. Doesn't know the menus and all the flash and stuff like that. But what it is good at is playing movies in the absolute highest quality of any source uh, from 10 bit and everything. So I think that's I think that's it. Um, pretty sure that is it. So yeah, uh, that was long winded, I know, um, but I wanted to explain fully, uh, you know why I choose the settings that I choose and how to get the best picture quality out of uh, the player uh, why I use the player and uh, yeah um, I hope you got something from this uh, thanks for watching and um, I guess I'll leave, I'll leave some links in the description and stuff uh, if people do want to check this player out um, if you're not willing to spend, like this player was, um, you know, it's a thousand dollars. It's an expensive player, but this is this is my hobby. Watching movies at the highest quality possible, surround sound, Dolby Atmos, all the sound and everything set up. If this is this, I've done this like with laser disc players and DVD players and everything. I always, when it comes to this specific thing, my thing, <laughs> my enjoyment. I buy the best player on the market, and that is this player. However, there is a cheaper version, the 820. Um, I, I think it reckon, I think it retails for 499. However, it's always, I think, it, it does always go on sale for like 350, things like that. And um, I'm a stickler for uh, um, build quality. Uh, you know, it does. It doesn't have the build quality. It does feel a little plastic. Uh, plastic. You know, the little cheap. The remote isn't as good. Um, I am. You know, I. I am spoiled. I'm a spoiled brat. You know, I. I like. I like having nice things, especially when it's home theater. Home theater for me is. I. I don't care how much it costs, for the most part. You know, I'm not talking. Uh, I'm not talking Trinoff levels of like ultra high-end receivers and processors and stuff, but within reason when it comes to the players themselves, the 4K players, there's pretty much nothing I wouldn't pay as long as the quality is there and this is the best way to view this. So, yeah. Well, that's the, that's the video. Uh, that's all my settings. And yeah. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. Bye.